Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be interesting. I'm not sure I'll be quite as entertaining as Alice was if you were in the room for the last presentation, because um, that was really some fantastic advice. And uh, actually, I work in our Vancouver, Canada lab. And uh, listening to some of the remote work comments that Alice had, if you were able to, uh, to be here for that, was fantastic, because we, of course, have a very similar thing with following the sun and development. And I think we have development now in 11 different offices around the world. And coordinating all of that is really, really difficult. And her key point about documentation stuff just really hit home, because it's, it's both our biggest success and our biggest failures every single time we have something to celebrate or something to go back and do a root cause analysis. So um, that was fantastic. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about um, non, or I'm, well, I'm going to talk about the threat that Unix, and particularly Linux, is actually presenting to Windows. Um, we, I don't want to go down the deep, dark rat hole of whether there's much malware for Linux. Sadly, there's probably more development effort going into writing malware for Linux now than there ever has been, largely related to uh, a lot of Internet of Things devices. We've seen you know, botnets of home routers and these types of things, which is kind of changing the payoff for criminals to bother writing malware to attack Linux. Uh, but the real threat of Linux is mostly aimed outward, which is Linux as a very robust hosting platform. And that's when we kind of talk about some of the things we see in the lab and how we see that coming together, why it's working so well for the criminals. And, uh, and we'll see if you have any questions. Um, you know, kind of started out thinking about penguins and things with Linux and attacking Windows. And I came up with the concept first off of angry birds, but it wasn't really this kind of an angry bird. It was more along the lines of this. But then I thought it might be more appropriate to, to use an actual attacking penguin. That, that is a, apparently what they look like when they're attacking. It's not terribly fierce. I mean, maybe if you were there, it'd be more intimidating. Um, but there, there's a very famous story, actually, about uh, uh, Linus Torvalds being attacked by a penguin at the, I believe, at the uh, Melbourne Zoo. He was there with Andrew Tridgell. And uh, apparently, uh, penguins like him about as well as the rest of the community when chatting with him on the kernel list. Um, but it's pretty remarkable to think of, of, of a penguin attacking Linus. But uh, that, that's what I envision in my head it might have looked like. But uh, realistically, looking at the criminal side of this, you know, we're going, you know, why, why really target Linux systems? And obviously, almost all criminal operations on the internet are focused on some sort of profit in the end, and that profit might be the theft of intellectual property, or it might be raw profit, like it is with, say, ransomware, taking people's files hostage. Uh, there's lots of different ways, but in the end, it's all motivated largely by money, one way or another, money and power. And, uh, you know, looking at it, I mean, obvious, Linux just becomes a really, really obvious target. Uh, you know, on the left side there, I've, uh, that obviously is a data center, lots of cables, I've got a stock photo from a, uh, Creative Commons source there, but you know, realistically, Linux boxes are great for distributing this stuff. Whether you're using them as an offensive platform directly to attack other systems, or whether you're using them to distribute uh, malicious web pages, malicious advertisements, you know, malware itself targeting other platforms, uh, Linux boxes aren't usually on desktops. I mean, in this case, uh, I am running Arch Linux, and I use that for all my test systems. Uh, it's not common as a desktop platform. It's probably more common in this building right now than maybe anywhere else on Earth, um, just because of this conference being here. But it's still not that common. The number of, um, I see more than a few glowing apples reflecting back at me. And um, it, you know, realistically, it's a server platform, right? But that also means it's usually on highly redundant equipment and highly redundant data centers with redundant everything, power, data network, um, every, everything is really reliable. And so that makes it a really great attack platform. Now in the center there, does anybody know what that picture is? Yes, I heard somebody say US-Canadian border, right? That is the US-Canadian border, and there's 3,000 more miles of that. Um, and it's undefended, right? And that's another problem that we're really seeing being coming a bigger and bigger issue on these Linux systems. Uh, we don't have a lot of process around how we're managing Linux boxes from a security perspective. And I, I imagine if you're a large administrator yourself, that may not be true for you. Uh, certainly in, in uh, you know, I work with a lot of universities and a lot of uh, rather large uh, enterprises that, w that we commercially have business with. And obviously when we're dealing with professional system administrators, we have better success with there being processes and standardization and automation, hopefully around things like configuring firewalls, uh, making sure IP tables is set up, using IPSs, using WAFs, these types of things. But if we look at the, the number of hosts on the internet running Linux, 
the, almost none of them are defended, right? Percentage-wise, you're managing a very small percentage um, if we exclude perhaps the, the Amazons and Googles of the world. Um, but when we're talking about uh, non-large cloud provider hosted machines, they have a tendency to be largely undefended. So they're a really good attack platform because if you're not looking for threats there, it's a very, very long time to discovery that there's a problem. Because if you're not you know, monitoring logs, if you're not running antivirus, you're not doing this, that, or the other thing, um, you'll stay infected for a very long time or maybe harbor something malicious for a very long time. So realistically, we're looking at two primary reasons behind targeting Linux. Um, and right now, that is weapons, which primarily is DDoSing. Um, there's already some research to suggest the botnets that were going after ProtonMail last week and the week before were Linux powered. Um, and of course, distribution, uh, you know, the, the high availability. Well, um, so there, there are threats that actually target Linux. Um, the pie chart looks much more impressive than it really is. The, there's, there's more of the typhoid Mary of hosting Windows stuff on Linux boxes than there is of actual Linux threats. But I just ran this report. This is the last seven days from the lab of Linux detections that we had from our clients using our, our software. Now, keep in mind, this is not much data. So let's put this in perspective. That's 96 machines calling home to us saying, I found malware. So this isn't like some giant problem. But you can see it's quite diverse. And if you look at some of the names there, about 3 quarters of them are Linux slash DDoS something, which tells you that most of the, the things that we're detecting that, be, that actually harm Linux systems themselves, you know, malicious ELF binaries or obfuscated uh, PHP scripts and this type of thing that, that we find, you'll see there's a few Linux slash shell, I think, mixed in there. There's a Linux Bitcoin miner that hit a few machines. There's, um, um, we're still seeing, if you see, there's Linux RSTA over here on the left and over on the right in a slightly bigger pie slice, there's Linux RSTB. That is a, let's see, let me do the math, 12 and a half year old piece of ELF malware that hasn't changed in 12 and a half years that's still spreading and infecting Linux boxes because they're undefended. Um, it guesses weak admin passwords and weak SSH, basically spreads through SSH and it looks for Oracle, Oracle and admin, admin and admin let me in and admin difficult to type and these types of things. And it's still infecting hosts. Um, we, we run a sinkhole for that that we've been running since 2008. And we're still averaging about 12,000 call homes a month from unique machines that are infected with it. And the malware hasn't changed since 2003. So to me, that does support some of my argument going, we're not, we're not taking well enough care of the systems that we're managing because this kind of thing shouldn't be happening. Um, and, and you know, mostly, like I say, uh, DDoS stuff that we have seen in some of these very high bandwidth DDoS attacks. So, so to some degree, I mean, we should save Linux to save the world because it's being used to harm others more than it's being used to harm Linux admins, right? We're not really seeing, certainly in targeted attacks, people are, you know, breaking into Linux systems, running databases and things to steal information. But the vast majority of the crime we see is opportunistic and they're not stealing from the Linux admins themselves, they're just using you as a platform to harm other people. So how can we maybe, you know, maybe use Linux um, to save the world a little bit? Uh, I think most folks had heard of the PlayStation and Xbox Live outages last Christmas holiday. That was a Linux botnet running on hacked D-Link routers largely. Uh, depending which country you're in, the brand changes because there's only like three companies that make these cheapo little routers and then they get OEM'd to 90 different uh, public brands that you see. But that, that botnet um, code, the source code's available out there, unfortunately, which means there's lots of vari variations on it now. Uh, does the same type of thing. It's looking for admin interfaces listening on the outside with default passwords because apparently when we write code, we haven't learned that you shouldn't hard code passwords yet. Um, these types of things, but you know, these, these systems are being uh, amassed to harm other things. We're not really sure about Proton Mail yet. Uh, there's also a bit of, I don't want to, I'm not trying to fan the hype on this stuff either, because if you read uh, a lot of security websites, you would, you would think there's a botnet army of refrigerators coming to attack, and uh, it simply hasn't gotten to that yet. But if we continually deploy embedded cheap devices that you can go to Fry's and pick up for, you know, I, I can buy a $19 smart light bulb that's TCP brand <laughs> um, and has Linux embedded in it, right? Like everybody's embedding Linux because of its free nature into all these devices, but they're not taking any care in protecting them, right? So we, we potentially are going to see a very different malicious future to the Linux platform, I think, which is that we're not going to be seeing so much of worrying about our server infrastructure. We're going to be worrying about the 73 things in our home that all have an IP now that are running Linux that can't be patched. 
Um, and I'm not really sure what we're going to do about that, other than those of us that are, are more activist in our community they need to be engaged. So if, if we're working for an organization that's embedding Linux and things, we need to be towing the line a little more strictly around, well, how do we patch these things and how do we make it automatic? Because my mom is not going to patch her refrigerator. She doesn't even really know what a patch is. Um, and she shouldn't need to. We need to take care of this stuff on behalf of the people that entrust us with building their systems. So. Uh, just one last thing on actual Linux malware, more hype, I think, but uh, Dr. Webb, a Russian antivirus firm, published this week that they discovered a Linux ransomware variant specifically targeting, it appears to be targeting uh, web servers. If you look at the screenshot there, which I can't see very well myself from the angle I'm standing at, and it's really tiny on my screen, uh, but you can see it, the, the, the paths it targets for encrypting files starts with var www. So it looks like it's specifically looking at taking data. I think there's var lib mysequels in the list as well. So looking at taking databases and web servers hostage more than probably individual workstations to grab documents the way we see in the Windows world. This is not in any way widespread. In fact, the only way I was able to get a copy was by asking Dr. Webb. Um, so this isn't something that's currently widely out there, but it does show some of the way the gears are turning in criminal minds going, if I can get $500 for, from some person whose Windows machine's infected because I'm holding their Excel spreadsheets hostage, how much could I get for the MySQL database, right? How much could I get for the website? And hopefully most of us are better at that. I, I think it's kind of a, a, a strange tactic personally because everybody I know that professionally publishes websites typically is checking them in and out of a version control system and it's not like you don't have a backup of your website and hopefully your databases. But um, we say that and we also hope that people don't choose the password let me in, but they do. So. There's probably enough fools out there for, for this to potentially be a profit, uh, profitable action for the criminals. We're keeping an eye. I, I'm trying to remember. There's a name of a, a CMS that there's a zero day in right now. That the, Well, it's not zero day anymore. It was patched uh, last week that, according to Dr. Webb, is what uh, the criminals are using to install this onto systems uh, that aren't patched. I can't remember the name of the CMS, though, because it wasn't one of the big ones that we all think about when we think of content management, like you know the Joomla's and the WordPress's of the world. So I looked at uh, 171 or 171,621 websites that were infected over a one-week period. Uh, so we d I just took basically every bad URL from Sophos Labs web database for a week. So that turns out to be about 172,000 URLs. Many of those are repeat on the same website, right? So we may detect 20 different URLs on some VPS host that was compromised that may you know all be one IP address. So when I uniqued them down to just unique IPs, I believe the, the total was 121,121 unique IP addresses that we newly discovered that week that had something bad on them. Now most of those, uh, you know, sort of the, the Pareto principle here, the 80-20 rule kind of thing, about 80% of them didn't have something dangerous on them themselves. They were redirecting people towards something dangerous that was owned by a criminal. So about 20% of them actually had malware or malicious JavaScript that targeted Flash or Java or something like that. And about 80% of them were just iframes and things being injected into innocent web pages to direct people down the chain into that, you know, sort of that funnel, right? And I looked at what, what web services were running on all of these particular infected hosts. So we can see the, not surprisingly, the biggest chunk of the pie there is Apache. Um, followed up by Microsoft. I lumped all the Microsoft web services together, so that includes anything that identifies itself as Microsoft. So that's Windows XP Home Edition web server, you know, everything is lumped in there. 99% of it is IIS, much of it very old IIS, IIS 6 and IIS 7. Um, but but I, I didn't break them out into separate buckets. I just said all Apache minus Apache Win32 went in the Apache bucket. All IIS went in the IIS bucket, and um, I, I did do a little bit of an OS breakdown on the back end. Um, there were three Macs hosting bad content of the 121,000 IPs. Um, I, I, the, the BSD number was very small; it was about 0.3% that that I could positively identify were FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, some non-Mac uh, BSD variant, um, and then the rest were either Windows or or Linux. Uh, there's a couple of outliers in there. I found it odd when I first started doing this, I'm like almost 10% were Google. And of course, Google doesn't commercially ship a web server that you and I can just decide to fire up uh, our websites on. 
So I'll get into that in a second. I, I did dive into that a little deeper because I found that a bit strange because there's no you know, Google web server and most people don't fake their web server strings to pretend they're Google. Um, so I wanted to compare that and say, well, what do these numbers look like compared to the Netcraft data for the, uh, the, the period that I did the survey, right? So I grabbed what are websites actually running during that time period and let's see what the differences are. And so it looks like you know, Microsoft web servers are about 20% less likely to host malware than their portion of the internet that they host uh, websites for. And we can see if we add up Apache and Nginx, um, they're kind of even-ish, and then there's that Google outlier again. So I wanted to isolate that and figure out what was really going on there. What is this Google? Um, I, I put things in an other bucket that were identified. So I, I tried to sort out things that I knew I couldn't positively identify. So I took like everything behind Cloudflare got thrown in the other bucket, because that all identifies as Nginx, and it's not helpful, right? Because we don't really know what the web server behind Cloudflare is running. Uh, so if I could identify it as a known proxy, I tossed it out, because I didn't figure that was really valid data to help figure out what was going on behind the scenes. So then, um, infected versus netcraft on, uh, so we put things in two buckets in the lab, what we call infected and what we call malware repository or known malware destinations. And it's important for us to go, these known malware destinations are things controlled by criminals where they're basically allowed to host exploit kits and malware. And so those to us are very interesting from a reputation standpoint, right, because they're hard to move around. They're what used to be called bulletproof hosts if you've been following security for a while. There's certain internet providers that no matter what kind of a takedown or abuse they're served up will continue to serve the child porn and the malware or whatever it is they have online. And that's important to us because, of course, they're unlikely to clean up their act and they're likely to be large swaths of IPs that are easy for us to decide are bad and try to protect our customers from, whereas infected, Almost, hopefully everything in the infected bucket means these are innocent websites that have been compromised in some way to direct people to those things that are owned by the bad guys. And so these ones we want to keep checking all the time because it could be your kid's soccer blog website that has the schedule on it that you have to check once a week to remember which night of the week you got to drop them off at the game. And if it's, you know, because it's an innocent website, if it's cleaned up, we don't want to be stopping people from getting to it. Um, so we treat them very differently. So the infected websites, the numbers change quite dramatically because we can see Microsoft drops even lower, um, sort of suggesting that, that few innocent sites are being compromised that are running Microsoft web servers, and Apache jumps up, and, and Nginx drops down, which, again, not terribly surprising, and Google nearly, um, nearly vanishes, uh, which is great. Um, it at least starts to sort out what we're seeing coming from Google and why that you know, distorted statistic was in there. And it kind of supports some of the other things I believe, which is most amateur web hosts, people that are more likely to get themselves in trouble and not secure their sites properly, people buying uh, uh, cheap web hosting services to self-host on oneandone.net or GoDaddy or these types of things are probably all running Apache, right? That's the most common freely available software that it's easy to just pay $1.99 or go on some free host and that's what you're going to you know, be hosted on. Um, less likely so with Nginx, right? We see professional developers and largely the Russian community loving our Nginx um, uh, when, when it comes to the malware side. So looking at the malware destinations, uh, Apache drops way down, so it looks like the criminals host intentionally hosting malicious stuff seem to prefer Nginx, but also Google. Uh, and that's where I started diving into it a little further. And so I, I basically manually went through a whole bunch of the Google URLs, and um, every single one of them was either a blogger or a blog spot, URI. Um, so there, none of them were on google.com or gmail.com or anything that you and I would normally associate with Google every day. None of them that I could find were in Google's ad networks, suggesting they understand um, where their bread is buttered. Uh, but yet, Blogger and Blogspot seem to be a real weak point for this. And at least uh, the last time I checked this a couple months after I did, I did the research uh, at the end of the, um, uh, I, I re-ran it after scale. I, I presented this at scale. I re-ran the numbers in May and they were almost identical. Um, so nothing seems to have changed too much, and when I'm looking at it, again, the, the average life of many of the pieces of malware I found that were uploaded or the exploit kits that were being hosted on Blogger and Blogspot were at least two or three weeks, which is, imagine having free Google bandwidth and hosting for three weeks is pretty good for the crooks. So I'm, I'm suspecting that Google just needs to apply some of their security practices that they have for their mainline assets a little more strictly scrutinizing what's getting uploaded into the 
Blogger and Blogspot assets because um, I don't I don't think I could pick a company that seems to do a better job of keeping malware off of the the primary brands uh, than Google um, and and their their malware scanning and Gmail seems to be phenomenal. So uh, I know they can and I've I've let uh, some security folks at Google that I have relationships with know about this and we're hoping to see maybe some policy changes. Uh, I, th I suspect commercially Google doesn't really care about Blogspot anymore, but that's not a good reason to leave it up and let it host this stuff. Um, so if we look at uh, the compromised poisoned web, uh, what are we detecting out there? Uh, the, the big blue swath there, that particular detection, uh, is the Angular exploit kit, probably the most popular exploit kit that we see out there right now. Um, the top three or four are almost all related to um, either the Angular exploit kit or the, um, is it nuclear? Uh, no, it's not nuclear. I can't remember the name of the other one now. I had it in my notes, but for some reason my notes aren't showing up on my screen, so I won't tell you unless you ask later. Um, but largely, uh, a lot of that is exploit kit. No, this is what our, our, our protected customers are reporting back to us that their endpoints are seeing. Um, uh, as far as malicious content, but you can see there's very few malware names listed there. It's almost all redirects, iframes, these types of things. It's the top of that attack chain redirecting people down to the very small funnel at the end where the malware is. But, you know, statistically this is distorted as well. Um, keep in mind because we're, if we detect that it's an exploit kit and we've blocked it, the person never got to the payload, so the payload won't ever show up in the chart if we detect the first stage. So these numbers aren't necessarily reflective um, of what could happen to those PCs were they not running some sort of protection. But it gives us some idea of uh, the, the popularity of different, um, different attack vectors. And we also looked at it from the, the network standpoint. Now iframe AR, the big chunk there, that's compromised ads. Um, that's one of our generic detections for compromised ads, largely the open, the, what was the OpenX ad server which is an open source uh, ad server that I think has changed names now and had a lot of its vulnerabilities fixed, but we still see tons and tons and tons of hosts running OpenX, which hasn't been fixed in several years and has known, zero, uh, you know, known unpatched vulnerabilities. And it's very, very easy for criminals to inject malicious iframes into those advertisements. So um, that's not you know, Google Ads, that's not DoubleClick, that's not any of the major ad networks, but it's still a, a, a majority of the, uh, the malicious stuff that we're seeing uh, at the source. And if we look by region of all the malicious URLs, this is the breakdown for last week. Um, so it pretty much exactly reflects sort of where we host websites in the world, right? I mean, it's US, then Ireland, China, Russia, um, Germany, Singapore, Brazil, France, Great Britain, Netherlands, Turkey, and Poland. And uh, of course, uh, Ireland is disproportionately large there because there's lots of web hosts moving there. What, what was for the safe harbor protection by being in Europe, um, but I, my understanding is safe harbor is no more, so I'm not really sure if that stuff's going to stay in Ireland or not. So trying to figure out what to do about all this stuff, I mean, threat intelligence is a big buzzword in our community in the security world right now, and I don't find anything very intelligent about it. I got this yesterday. Um, this is warning me that um, there's apparently PHP shells out there that bad guys might try to upload to your web server to take control over your Linux boxes. Uh, of course, we track about two or 300 new ones a week, so it's not a surprise to anybody that's been looking. And yet, we sent out this bulletin, and of course, the systems that are affected are web servers that allow shells. I don't know what that means. I mean, uh, does that mean the web server has a shell? Because they all do. Or does that mean the web server has a dynamic programming language on it, like Perl, PHP, C Sharp, whatever, which they all do. Um, so it should just say web servers, I think, for systems affected. Um, but the, the, I mean, this is allegedly the advice we're giving you. And I'm not trying to pick on the cert here. This is a really hard problem. But uh, if you're going to know enough to do anything about this, I'm not really sure this is going to help. And you know, going further down, there is some useful things in there which we would agree with. Down at near the bottom, there's the delivery tactics section um, of the uh, advice, which at least gives you some ideas of where to look if you're getting hit with some of these shells, right? They, they are largely coming in through cross-site scripting. SQL injection, I, since it's been in the OWASP top 10 since inception, you would hope somebody would have tried to do something about that by now, but it still is common out there. Um, but when we're looking, it's mostly password guessing and vulnerabilities, from what I can tell. And I'll, I'll, 
Um, unfortunately, most of that is not scientific. That is uh, investigating incidents with customers all the time and just looking and trying to figure out and do forensics of what happened. And more often than not, that does seem to be the source. Uh, this was also yesterday from Oracle. Uh, don't like read things and don't necessarily, uh, I know they're trying to help. So this, uh, this particular uh, vulnerability is in the um, uh, Oracle web sphere. Web sphere, web objects, web, does it say there? Web logic. Um, it, it's uh, yesterday. Remote code execution without authentication. Okay, that's about as serious as it gets. It, but yet it has a CVSS score of 7.5, which, so a lot of the Fortune 500s I work with would say it's under an eight. So it's priority two. Read these things. There, there, there's no scoring system that takes context into consideration. A unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability in uh, you know, some internal tool is completely different than your web server, right? And you have to understand the context. And CVSS doesn't take context into consideration, right? So you know, if this is an externally facing web service, that takes it from 7.5 to 11, right? And there is no, well, yes. So don't, let, don't turn it up to 11 all the time when you can with security, but read these things because they're not, they're not all, they're not all giving stupid advice like, you know, check web servers for websites with shells. Um, they have useful stuff in them, but unfortunately it's obfuscated to protect branding, I think. Um, we, we do see Microsoft as well decide that things like privilege, uh, escalation of privilege bugs aren't necessarily critical enough that you should have to fix them or always considered, you know, a warning level. And uh, I think it's trying to not get caught up in the it's the end of 2014, how many Microsoft vulnerabilities were there that were critical? And if they can keep the numbers smaller, then the press won't attack them. Um, and, and unfortunately, these things get manipulated. So you really do, you know, sign up for security advisories for whatever products you're using, including those uh, uh, dynamic languages, right? So if you're administering Linux hosts, make sure that you're on the Apache or Nginx security list. Make sure you're on the PHP or Perl or whatever you're using security list. If you're using something like Tomcat, you know, get on that. Uh, make sure you're on these lists and read those things when they come through because uh, you may not always have time to patch things immediately and it may be a whole process and change control and you know there's always lots of complication in the world. Um, but it's usually only 30 seconds to read the advisory to make a decision about whether that's something to push through that change control or not. And um, I did a very informal survey of the 121,000 just if I could quickly with WGET grab the index of every site and determine based on the structure of the homepage that it was WordPress or Joomla or it hosted cPanel on the right port numbers, et cetera. I did that and almost all of them um, that were hosting malicious content were both either running Plex or cPanel uh, for an administration side and almost all of them have one of those three CMSs on them. So it does suggest that that's probably uh, one of the ways uh, these boxes are becoming compromised. Um, I did some spot checking of version numbers. So like if, if the box reported itself as Red Hat and it said it was Apache 2.4.26 or whatever version, I checked for that version of Red Hat. Was that the latest one that Red Hat published? And again, something like 85% of the ones I spot checked clearly hadn't been patched in at least a year. Um, so that, that kind of leads me to some of the, the wrap up and advice piece. Um, from my perspective of what things that we can do that are going to be the most effective. I put that picture of the cloud up there. Uh, if you're like me, you're probably one of the most influential computer people in, in the people around you's lives, right? Your, your family and your friends and your business associates come to you to ask you for advice on, hey, I need to set up my kid's soccer blog and uh, what should I do? And a lot of the answer in the past had been, you know, to pay for that $1.99 name cheap DNS hosting and grab a, a free website because, hey, I mean, who wants to out of pocket, you know, $300 a month for the kid's soccer blog, right? And um, I think we need to be pushing our friends and family. Amateur admins should not be running these systems, right? We need professional administrators uh, administering these hosts because they have a lot of power behind them and a lot of that bandwidth can be wielded as a weapon. Um, so our friends and family need to get pushed to cloud hosts or, or you host it for them, one or the other. But, you know, the truth is I don't want to host my family's blogs. I just as soon send them to WordPress.com or somewhere else. Yes, sir. I'm going to hold that for the question time, and then I would, I'll try to address it if it doesn't take us all night, and if it does, we'll have to have beer. 
because uh, I would love to, and I'm, not, I'm trying not to name any names because I don't like lawyers. Um, <laughs> but but I, especially when I'm not being taped, I might be more willing. And I'm not, when I've named a few names today, I'm not specifically picking on those companies. And I will say about one and one.net that I think they were less than 1% of the sites that I surveyed in that particular case, so not picking on that specific brand because I do not want to talk to the lawyers in the morning. Um, but yeah, the, the, I, I, there's multiple approaches to this, but one of the things is we have to have, uh, you know, I, I don't believe we've made it easy enough for people to host these things safely on their own when they're amateurs. And so I'd, I personally am pushing my friends and family toward hosted stuff that just works. And maybe that's, you know, max at home so I don't have to remove ransomware. No. Um, other thing, the, the patch I put in the corner, that, uh, it's surprising how few administrators have a consistent applied policy for patching Linux boxes, right? So uh, I think it's one of the reasons we're seeing Windows boxes compromised less often, is every, win every Windows admin has a policy about what happens on Patch Tuesday. And they go and they look and they go, okay, it's a web server, these three are critical, our maintenance window's next Thursday, we test on these boxes over here and then we roll out and this is all the plan and it happens every month. When do you patch Red Hat, right? Well, there's patches every day for Red Hat, largely, almost. Um, so there's no patch day, right? Like you have to decide based on either the subscribing to those security mailing lists and making judgment calls around high priority security issues coming up and then deciding it's, it's time to initiate a change control in a patch window, or it needs to just be, you know, follow the Windows approach. If, if the second Tuesday of the month is Windows patch day, then what about the fourth Tuesday and apply the exact same process to patching your Unix and Linux environment that you apply to the Windows environment? Give it monthly love, uh, unless you get a critical thing about the next heart bleed or something and you know, have a process around it. So the team is prepared, there's time in the schedule, management's ready to approve the change control, everybody's got a thing, we know what to do because we do it all the time, and because it's practiced, we get good at it. Um, so I, th I think patching is critical because almost all these systems were unpatched. Um, there's a pile of tools up there in the corner. We leave all of our tools around, like kids leave toys out of the playpen. Um, that's great for, for leaving uh, a perfect opening for targeted attackers to come in and steal everything else you have. We see over and over um, you know, web servers with full you know, GCC installed so I can build my own tools after I compromise it. Um, you know, it it's super easy on Linux systems to knit together an entire attack platform without downloading anything, right? Oh, Netcat and TCP dump, great. I don't need anything else. I now own the rest of your network. Um, so try to, you know, don't have Nmap and TCP dump and Netcat and GCC and all this stuff on production deployed platforms. And it's always been best practice, I think, in the Unix world to not do that. But I think we've often gotten lazy about it because it wasn't specifically about security. It was just about, you know, this is the right way. Well, there's more reasons than it's just the right way. Uh, can we eliminate Telnet from all products forever? I, that's not really a shh, that's an SSH. Um, we still see Telnet and FTP on a lot of these systems, in particular FTP for web servers. I've heard of SFTP, SCP? It's not hard, it really isn't. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't want to do it at scale for people that are professional creatives, but it's, there's good tools out there. It, there's not really a good excuse for it. Um, Two-factor authentication, if you're an administrator, you should not have the excuse that it's too inconvenient to grab a token out of your pocket. Um, it may be too inconvenient for everybody else in the company to do every single little thing, but you're administering probably your company's brand, you're administering your customer's PII potentially, and back to the thing being a very large digital weapon that if it's unsecured, it's easy to commandeer. Um, you owe it to yourself to not have a password stealing Trojan or a guessable password be that you're undoing. And we're seeing a lot of SSH keys being stolen from scripts that aren't locked down well as well, right? So you've got scripts to copy all this stuff out, but that account has a shell or some other thing, right? So those, those, no, those passwordless SSH keys, your SSH keys for logging into systems should not be passwordless. They should be able to be stolen without you fearing anything and running around and being able to just put a new key out there. Um, but we do see a lot of um, malware now looking for stored credentials in browsers, looking for stored SSH keys in PuTTY on Windows systems, this type of thing, and stealing them on the hope that they're passwordless and they can use them to compromise systems. And lastly, not just because I sell a bunch of this stuff, there's free and open source versions of all of it that you can use. I don't really care what you use, but use, you know, use something, firewalls, IDS, WAF. I mean, I'm detecting all this stuff. 
with tools that supposedly uh, are, are ineffective at blocking bad stuff. So that, that suggests maybe I'm seeing the tip of the iceberg. If we're really as bad as a lot of the people like to say the security community is, then there's even more. But if I'm able to find that much, and I'm, I'm, I'm largely using free tools for most of my stuff other than uh, our antivirus, um, it's not hard to block a lot of this stuff, right? It's pretty easy to detect, and, and it really doesn't need to cost much money. And in particular, the, the, um, like we give away our antivirus totally for free for Linux systems, specifically for this reason. So anybody that wants it, you just go to our website and download it. There's no charge. There's no subscription. There's no personal information surrendered to us, uh, et cetera. So that's my thing. Um, I'm going to give a very short answer to his question about <laughs> going after the providers. Um, and then I'll ask, uh, open up for other questions. And I think we'll probably have to follow up on that more because it's a rather, I mean, that could be a talk. Um, it's, a, it's a really challenging problem. And um, so there, there are a lot of known well-behaved providers. And I'll pick one, out of, I'll pick two out of my hat, um, uh, or th I'll pick three that I know I've personally had good relations with. Rackspace, Akamai, and Amazon as sort of cloud CDN-ish companies, right? Not a problem, right? It's really super easy to report. One, you don't hardly find anything because they're so good at blocking abuse. They find it before we find it. If we find it, they've already fixed it by the time we tell them. Um, there's really no issue there, right? And similar with Google, although it's been a little harder for me to weave my way through the infrastructure at Google to find the blogspot people and find out what's going on. Um, but largely, you know, those types of companies are really good at responding to abuse. Uh, I mean, a lot of it's, it all depends on which part of the attack chain you're trying to address, right? Because you've got the bulletproof hosts that are hosting the known malware destinations, the, the domains that are actually hosting the, the malware itself, which is getting harder to identify now than it ever was. So if you look at things like Crypto Locker and these types of things, a lot of the communications going through Tor and now even payloads are starting to be delivered through Tor, which is making it harder for us to identify the bad actors, um, uh, for sure. Then you've got the known bad actors that you just can't do anything about, and there's a whole bunch of these, in particular in Moldova. Um, and, I mean, what we do is just blacklist them, right? And we would encourage everyone else to as well. Uh, and just go, well, if you've got innocent customers, we're sorry you got mixed up in the mess, but you know, you're on such a dodgy provider that we just can't possibly allow our customers to communicate with you anymore. Uh, but it's not, unfortunately, not that easy politically because uh, there, there are lawyers. <laughs> Back to that. So, the, you know, one thing lawyers can do is say, don't say GoDaddy at the conference. And I'm not trying to pick on GoDaddy if the lawyers are in the room. Um, but that's one thing, right? Like, hey, you're, you're, you're besmirching our brand. But, but, but on top of that, there's well, you blocked access to our legitimate customers, and now we're going to sue you for damages. And so the, the litigious nature of our system makes it really difficult to name and shame, for one, publicly. I think privately, if you talk to, like our guys in the labs regularly talk to people that administer some of the ASNs that are trouble, and um, usually have a re reasonable personal relationship, and it's not any secret which ASNs are dirty. Um, but we can't say it publicly, so it's hard to dissuade people from buying products and services from those, those providers. Then you've got the other side of it, which is the, the cheap hosts that provide uh, you know, free or cheap VPS hosting and that kind of thing. And uh, I mean, I'd love recommendations on what we can do to put more pressure on those companies. I mean, with last two weeks ago, was it 000 web host was compromised and dumped all their unencrypted user passwords and all this kind of stuff, and they basically just came out and said, yeah, well, for our paying customers, we try to protect that information, but we don't really care. So, I mean, it's pretty hard to address that, right? They've acknowledged that they're assholes, so what can I do about it? Oh, um, self-censored, oops. Uh, but, I mean, what can I do about it, right? Like, uh, they've already done it for me, and apparently it hasn't really hurt their business any, so I'm not really sure what the answers are there. We, uh, if, if people have suggestions, I think this is one of the things where, as a community, we should be coming together and having meetings to talk about who they are and figuring out what our strategy is going to be. And I'm not sure, I think some of that happens in small pockets right now, but maybe we need to be binding a little bit more of, uh, a little more togetherness, right? More, more of the, the, the bandwidth providers and the service providers and the security companies and, you know, other people, all the stakeholders, right? Yes, sir.
Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we certainly do in our pro So the question is, if you know an area is more dodgy than another area, can you be more aggressive about scanning or filtering and that type of thing? And a absolutely. Um, and, and we do, you know, we try to do that within our own things. We know our, our in our antivirus products, for example, the concept behind an identity often will say, well, the, if you see this particular thing, and that could be a, a, a reputation of an IP, instead of doing this faster scan, you know, just go ahead and slow down <laughs> things for five seconds and just give it, right? Like, make sure you really look into it as closely as possible to see if it's bad. But unfortunately, there's a million ways to obfuscate things, right? And, and as people point out, you can never enumerate all the bad in the world. And so it's, uh, it's challenging, right? I mean, um, sure, Mario. Okay, go, go, you, sir. So the, the, the question is around, it, it sounds like a political problem, and what types of changes would we like to see that would help us perhaps uh, have to engage with lawyers less often? And unfortunately, there's just, being a global company, there's, really good, there's no good answer to that, right? Because if we wanted to address this specifically as being a US problem, we could dive into you know, how overly aggressive the CFAA or the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is in one area versus other areas that, that where we don't have the latitude to do things we'd like to do to protect people better. But this isn't a US problem, right? We're dealing with countries all around the world and that, it, you know, makes it a lot more complicated from a policy standpoint. Now, there are some working groups trying to filter out the truly non-black, partly gray people, the people that, you know, write legal spyware that like to sue us for calling it malware and then we have to call it something else like a potentially unwanted application. You might not want this browser toolbar. We're pretty sure you don't, but if we block it, they'll sue us. So we'll call it potentially unwanted and give you the option to choose the box that says, please don't put toolbars on my computer. And then you chose and we didn't and they can sue you. Um, that kind of thing, right? And so there are working groups being created for, for the true gray people. Those guys, technically by their license agreement, are legitimate things. You agreed to install the toolbar because you forgot to uncheck the box, and therefore we can't block it. But there are working groups for those types of things, whereas a community, at least, we're trying to truly isolate the... Because I, I don't think the malware authors are going to show up in court to sue us over these things. So if it's truly just the true black cats, if you will, then we probably can get away with naming them. <laughs> because if they want to show up in court, I, I'll let them sue me because there's going to be somebody waiting for them. Um, and you know, if they want to step on US soil, it'll be very interesting. Um, Mario? Uh, you mentioned that there's a difficulty in um, shaming or, or saying that some, you know, some product has, you know, these bad features, et cetera. But uh, so let's, let's try, what about anti-shaming? Where what I would say is, okay, so here is a whole bunch of Internet of Things, routers, et cetera, that mm. don't have uh, Telnet and FTP open. Uh, here are things that we have, you know, like it, instead of the top 10 worst, you right. say here's the top 10 best. Buy, buy this because these people are, are good or, citizens. Or they're recommended, the, the good you know, they have the, the, you know, fewer, blah, 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 you know, whatever I'm giving. Yeah, well, and, and there's, there's a couple aspects. I mean, I've been thinking about this idea that, you know, there should be a security rating or a security warranty on things for years, right? Like, when I go to the store and there's a box at Best Buy and one's 39 and one's 79, and I don't know if either of them are going to give me a patch eight days from now if I buy it and it's phone vulnerable, right? Like, if the warranty is one year par parts and service, why isn't it one year parts and service and security? Why am I not guaranteed? that I'm gonna get firmware fixes for a promised life of the device, whatever that might be. Is, is the promised life of my new iPhone three years or two years? I don't know, Apple won't tell me. I just have to imagine it's probably gonna be three years because that seems to be what they do. But it's really a guess because Apple won't tell you when you're discontinued anyway. You just magically stop getting updates. But I, you know, this is the kind of thing though, I don't know. And, and, and it's no better on Android. I'm not you know, after a particular brand here, right? But, as consumers, we're blind. We can't even make good choices if we want to make good choices because we don't ha we're not well informed enough to even be able to choose a, 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 a vendor that is doing the right thing. So I think there's a lot of room for praising companies that do the job well. And, and if, if there's some way to standardize it in any way, it might put pressure on the others to go, oh, I don't, you know, if, if all the little skew tags at Best Buy had a thing on it that said, 
this one's a one and this one's a four, the vendor that got a one is probably gonna change their tune because they don't want a one next to it on the shelf uh, that might hurt their brand. But um, I'm not, I'm, I haven't fully formulated what the answer to that's gonna be. But uh, I, 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 that, I would love to see that approach because it gets rid of the lawyers. Well, yeah, nothing's perfectly secure, of course, but um, I guess the, one, the way of shaming one product is by praising the one next to it. <laughs> yes, Josh? Uh, on that front, there's two things that are promising. Uh, one of them is Underwriters Laboratories has tried to avoid this mm. for a couple years, but CyberLab seal is going to 1.0 in February, primarily on medical devices first, but they're going to certify that they have a bill of materials of the parts inside, the software parts, that that list doesn't have known defects, that uh, they're patchable, and that they've been through static and dynamic analysis and fuzzing. So it's not going to tell you it's unhackable, but it no, will, it'll not. tell you a level of rigor. And then independently, the cavalry that I started, we have a five-star cyber safety framework. It just says, uh, do you have a published software development lifecycle? Do you have a published coordinating disclosure policy saying you won't see researchers? Do you have tamper evidence and logging of security events? Do you have security update capabilities? And do you separate critical systems from non-critical? So essentially, that becomes the five star for my mother-in-law to not care how it was done, but a right. five star is better than a three star. Absolutely, and I have one of those stickers on my laptop as well. Uh, <laughs> um, and I, I fully support, the, the concerns I have around the, the UL thing is just that somebody has to decide to pay for that. And that then just becomes, if the entire industry decides to ignore it, there's very little that can be done. Um, and, and if we can get more, pro is it Belkin that has the, uh, uh, there's a, the, there was one of the router vendors that was, had created uh, a, a task force around security stuff as well. I think it was Belkin. Um, I remember seeing the guys at B-Sides LA last year talking about it. And, you know, I guess if a few of these guys step forward, I guess the other problem with home routers, not that I want to go down that rabbit hole, um, is that mostly we get them from our providers and we don't really have a choice. And the providers themselves put back doors in them for their own convenience that further reduce, diminishes our security. So um, that's another talk, maybe next year. Uh, any other questions or comments? I'm out of time. So I will wrap up. Thank you. I hope. Thanks, you guys for coming.